Welcome to the smartest doctor in the room. I'm your host, Dr. Dean Mitchell. The medical diagnosis of candida or yeast hypersensitivity has been for a long time one of the most contentious diagnoses in medicine. In the 1990s, doctors could actually lose their license for diagnosing and treating patients with candida. In fact, that happened to a New York City doctor, a very famous one. But holistic medicine has certainly advanced in the past two decades, and many functional medicine practitioners are diagnosing and treating, including myself, uh, helping patients suffering with what we call uh, candida or yeast hypersensitivity. My guest today is Dr. George Croker. Uh, Dr. Croker worked for, I believe, over 30 years, maybe close to 40 years at La Crosse Allergy Associates in Wisconsin, uh, a very prestigious practice. I've, I've interviewed Dr. Mary Morris in the past from there. And, and as people may know, I knew her dad pretty well, Dr. Uh, David Morris, who was really a pioneer in sublingual immunotherapy. And I was really fortunate when over 20 years ago, I traveled out to La Crosse Allergy Associates to learn about sublingual allergy immunotherapy that working with Dr. Morris, I not only met his daughter, Dr. Mary, but also got to meet Dr. George Croker. And uh, Dr. Croker and I have had conversations over the years because uh, I've sought out his advice on treating patients with candida. So um, I've always used, you know, relied on him as an excellent source. And I know that Dr. Croker has helped thousands of patients with candida over the years. And in fact, he has written one of the only chapters in a medical textbook, I think it's called Food and Allergy Intolerances, that I know that even exists on Candida. So uh, with that introduction, I'd like to invite Dr. George Croker to our podcast. It's my pleasure, Dean. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, I'm not sure I'm the smartest doctor in the room. It depends upon how big the room is. Uh, if it's, closet, <laughs> it's big. If it's a closet, we might be okay. See, uh -huh. modesty will get you everywhere. Okay. Uh -huh. let's, George, let's go back to the Candida controversy. As you're well aware, I mean, again, you know, as I said, now it's a little bit more accepted, even though I still get so many patients who come in in tears saying the doctor would tell them this doesn't exist. It's all in your head. You got a psychiatric disease, you know, the whole spectrum of things. Why, you know, I have my opinions, which I'll bring forth, but why do you think candida as a diagnosis has been so controversial and actually despised by the general medical community? That, that is probably one of the most important questions I've struggled with over the years. I think there are probably two answers to that question, or two reasons. Reason one is something called the tomato effect. And this was written about in JAMA in, I believe, 1984 by a husband and wife team. Dr. James Goodwin uh, talked about the fact that the tomato effect in medicine holds back efficacious treatment. And uh, the tomato was a South American vegetable. Uh, it was brought uh, from South America by the Spanish back to England. Everybody ate it. Over here in America, no one ate it because they thought it being related to the uh, nightshade family was deadly poisonous. Interesting. Um, that. And if you interviewed somebody at that time and asked them why they don't eat it, they said, well, it's common sense. It's, it's poisonous. Well, how do you know it's poisonous? Well, we know that. That's what we're, we're taught. <laughs> yeah. And in 1820, a man uh, sat down, I don't know his name, uh, on the <laughs> in Philadelphia and ate a tomato. And everybody <laughs> rethought things. So we're taught in medical school, and you were taught and I was taught, that Canada is a usually harmless commensal organism that occasionally, if it overgrows, causes an infection. And that's, the, that's what we're taught. And we think that's all that it does. So when a doctor runs up against this issue, he or she says to themselves, well, we're taught that it's a harmless organism. It's not in, in, in you know, a bad organism. Exactly, anymore. right. Mm -hmm. uh, and therefore, that's all that is. But uh, as one lawyer friend of mine said, uh, absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. In other words, just because it's what we're taught doesn't mean it's the only thing. Right. Uh, but uh, I remember having a discussion with the head of our gynecology department at uh, our Mayo affiliated hospital and mentioning that with uh, the extreme problem that everyone faces in their practice with uh, vulval vaginitis, uh, 300 women globally with the issue, I would be happy to come and talk about allergy and uh, its effect on the vaginal tract. And there was this blank look on his face that said, I've never been taught that. 
I don't know about this. This is a mm. tomato that's poisonous. And that, mm. that's, that's reason one. And I think it's a huge one. Uh, reason two for us as allergists, and this, this almost deserves a separate podcast. Uh, allergists have abdicated their throne. Uh, we're as close to infectious disease doctors than any other specialty. We should mm -hmm. not be anatomically demarcated. Mm -hmm. Immune system, holistically speaking, affects mm -hmm. a multitude of organs. Mm -hmm. And our infectious disease colleagues are less fixated on an organ than they are on the, the body. Overall. Yeah. That's right. And how, yeah. they, how this organism can affect us. Imagine if, the, if you went into an infectious disease doctor and complained about a sore, red, swollen leg, and he or she told you they're just interested in the throat and the eyes and the nose. Right. So, Which is what happens in medicine. We, got so, we become so specialized, departmentalized, yeah. So, so the uh, typical allergist is not interested in fatigue, headaches, sugar cravings, uh, they're not interested in yeast vaginitis. They're not interested in uh, recurrent yeast infections. They don't ask about it in their histories. And, and we, have, we have, in a sense, abdicated where we were. We were once one of the, and if you look at, and I have a hobby of collecting old allergy textbooks. And if yes, you- Yes, I do, they're very interesting, yeah. These 1920 textbooks, 1930 textbooks, they were a treasure trove. Yes, they? yeah, they were, right. Those doctors really did, they had to rely so much on their history and detective exactly. work. Exactly. Yeah. They had to rely on their, their senses yeah. and their work. So those are the two reasons. You know, I, I'm just going to, uh, it's probably a similar way of looking at it. I've always thought about this question a lot too, because I, I've had to answer it a lot to patients. Like, why doesn't my doctor know about this and everything too? And I, I said two things, which are in my mind, which are interesting. One, and, and it really goes back to the podcast I just did before with Dr. Fasano on celiac disease. Doctors tend to not like when there's too many symptoms. This sounds bizarre. Oh, no. But they don't That's like when a, when a patient comes in and the, their typical answer would be, one disease can't give all of these symptoms, which is totally untrue because now we know obviously with celiac disease, it's not just the gut. It's you, you could get arthritis, you could get asthma, you know, all these things. So I think it overwhelmed a lot of doctors. And the other issue, which was really, you know, close to home with what I did because I trained during the AIDS epidemic in New York City, and my hospital was actually one of the research centers. So my department was actually allergy, infectious disease, and immunology. And again, I, I saw so many patients with AIDS that had oral candidiasis, thrush, or you know, other opportunistic infections. And I knew, obviously, but that was just one extreme. And so again, going back to like what you're saying, there's just so many symptoms that the doctors were uncomfortable moving out of their comfort zone of let's say, oh yes, I just do the ear, nose and throat area, whether it's an allergist, an ENT, and not realizing that when women, oh, they didn't tell you or you didn't ask because they're not gonna always come out and say it. I've had recurrent vaginitis. I have irritable bowel syndrome, you know, and this is all interrelated, you know, to what we're gonna get into today. So yeah, I think we, the two of us are thinking like, you know, Excellent. about this, yeah? yeah? So let's get into, cause I'm really interested because again, you know, you were so early involved with this. How did you get indoctrinated into diagnosing cancer? I forgot, did you mention you worked with, was it Dr. Randolph with chemical sensitivities or somebody right. else? Randolph, or? Randolph was a pioneer. He had one of the very first allergy fellowships at Harvard and uh, worked at Mass General for quite a while. Oh, I didn't know that, wow. Hmm. Very interesting man. Uh, he taught me, as long as we talked about it a minute ago, he said, in my experience, the more symptoms a patient has, the sicker they are and the more I need to listen. Mm, less the number of advice. symptoms, yeah. less. And he said, it's frustrating, was frustrating for him, just like it was for you, when you see these other doctors around you, just kind of push them away. So that was his experience too. Interesting. Uh, 1978, I had just taken my boards in internal medicine and was entering my fellowship and a patient called me back. And she goes, I just want you to know that, you know, I'm feeling really well now. And my symptoms are better, headaches, fatigue, and all this stuff. And it's not because of what you did. It's because <laughs> of a doctor in Birmingham, Alabama. Oh. So uh, I called this gentleman up. It was Dr. Uh, C. Orion Truss. Truss. Dr. Truss. We're going to get to him, Truss, right? Okay. 
uh, I said, I, I'm just, I'm a young doctor. I'm on the phone here with you because I trust this patient and she was an excellent reporter and she, she's well, and I'm impressed. What did yeah, you do? Right. And he, he told me the story. And then after that, I said, do you have any publications? And he said, no, but I'm coming out with one. Mm-hmm. So I said, okay, can you send it to me? So he did. And that was, of course, the, the seminal article he wrote in 78 on tissue injury related to Canada, the Albicans. And we became pen pals for a while. Oh, interesting. Um, mm. I had a patient in the hospital at that point who had a Canada infection, but she also had a lot of symptoms that, that were beyond that. Mm. And I ended up putting her on my statin and she got very mad at me. And I, I, I said, I'm, you know, what, what's wrong? And she said, the only thing that's ever worked this well for me to, to ameliorate my symptoms are as a short course of steroids. And, oh, and wow. I asked you not to give me steroids. And I told her, I gave you nice statin. I gave wow. you medication. Mm. She goes, but I feel good. What's the story? So that is a nutshell of my interest in it. I got uh, affiliated with Dr. Crook at allergy meetings after that. Right. Those are the two, just for the listeners, those are the two giants in the field. You know, what Dr. Croak was alluding to, Dr. Orion Trust was, uh, he wrote a book, I think, called The Missing Diagnosis. Correct. It and had then, all those articles. Yeah. Right. And then William Crook wrote the, the underground bestseller, The Yeast Connection, which is so many patients carried around. But most doctors, if they saw a patient walk in with it, would show them the door. And I, and I don't mean coming in. I mean going out, right? Am I correct? <laughs> that, is, that is absolutely correct. He popularized, if you would call it that, uh, uh, the, the whole concept to the layperson. He, his right. books had nice illustrations in them. He came out with cookbooks. Yes. Uh, he had several yes. dietitians he worked with. Yeah, I, I think it's really important because again, yes, this this was a lot of the the public and the sufferers with these conditions were sort of kind of reuniting before there was such things as you know Facebook and all these chats and everything. They were really having yeah. to form their own alliances to yep. to get heard. Yeah. Um, yeah, one of the books I really like, I just like to hold this up for the listeners to see too, is the Candida Cure. It was actually by Ann Boric. She was a naturopath yeah. in California who I knew well. Unfortunately, passed away and um, really took a lot of Dr. Crook's work. I think she had spoken with him to try to, again, make it understandable for the lay person so it's not such an overwhelming issue. But to Dr. Crook, if you were gonna explain to somebody listening to this who thinks they might have this, how would you explain candida? <laughs> That's a big question. Um, and why it becomes a problem. Because we all naturally have some yeast candida in our intestine. So is, where, where do things go wrong? You know, and, and how would you explain for someone to, who's considering saying, I think I have candida. I, I heard about this. I have a lot of these symptoms. What, what would you say to them? I would say uh, the analogy would be in order to have a fire, you have to gather wood and strike a match. And uh, so there are three parts to this issue. Uh, part one is, have you had on an occasion to grow uh, a significant amount of Canada in your store, in your history. Mm-hmm. And we know that classically one of the big, biggest contributors to the, to the Canada issue is recurrent antibiotic usage. Yes, and so important. from antibiotics. And um, that's question one. Uh, with that, a steroid medication in bursts repeatedly. Um, Trust and some of the early authors 40 years ago talked about birth control pills. My experience with the newer pills is not as much of an issue. Mm. Uh, and of course, a lot of sugar ingestion. So those things will grow a lot of Canada in an, in an individual. The second thing is, do you have physical signs of yeast overgrowth? Is your tongue coated? Do you have itching under the arms with a little rash or yeast vaginitis recurrently in a woman? Balanitis in a man, uh, uh, genital itching, uh, oh. intense bloating after meals, especially mm. sugary meals. So those would be signs that you physically have got some yeast growing. And if- oh, by the way, and just to interrupt for a second too, and the symptoms that you're describing, as you can imagine too, a lot of patients are reluctant or a little bit embarrassed to even mention these symptoms. And I, I think that's why it's so important that a doctor is on the lookout and listening carefully because, you know, um, it's, you know, again, patients are sometimes, you know, embarrassed to, to, you know, report some of these symptoms. 
That is so important, Dean. Yeah. That, that is worthwhile commenting on myself. And that is until I started to ask women in an allergy clinic, do you have problems with recurrent yeast vaginitis? Mm -hmm. I was astounded by the number of positives I got on that story. Right. And yet they wouldn't volunteer that information either because of personal modesty or more likely in my case, hey, he's an allergist. He's interested in my nose and throat. Mm -hmm. And I'm in here for my cough and my right. mold allergy. And I'm not going to tell them about these other issues. Yeah. And it, it, is, it was very interesting in my practice, Dean, when I would ask women about yeast issues like that in the vaginal tract. They would not, nobody's ever asked me that before, yeah. you know, other than their gynecologist. So the first thing is, have you had symptoms set up to contribute to yeast? The second one is, do you have physical symptoms of yeast or hints of it? And the third is, what are your symptoms? Right. And um, Dean, you know this better than I probably, but some of the hallmark symptoms are intense fatigue, feelings of flu-like illness without flu, yeah. uh, bloating and gas like we just mentioned, uh, intense sugar cravings. This is something people also don't mention unless you, you talk to them about it. Yeah. This, is, this is not a sweet tooth. People know it's different. Yeah. Uh, and, and people will get up in the middle of the night and go to the store. Right. Um, I had one woman, yeah, I had one woman who threw it all out when she read the East Connection, said, I'm, I'm just going to do it. And she lasted a day or two. And yeah, it's, it's tough. It's, it's, yeah, we're not, we're not, we don't, I don't want to minimize that, you know. And, uh, you know, it's interesting, yeah, the way you, the way you put that, because it, it is really hard for these patients. Um, it's also, you made me laugh, too, because it's one of the reasons I sort of almost changed how I represent myself. I like, to, and I like to think of myself as an immunologist and, and I doing holistic functional medicine. I allergist became like the minor thing because for two reasons, one, I am doing such a wide variety of things in my own practice, which I really enjoy. And the two is like, you, you're right. It's like, you know, when back early, in my early days of practice, when I was just really doing allergy, people wouldn't tell you these things. Like I, I, I shouldn't even tell you about my stomach thing. You're, you're an allergist. What would, you know I mean? People make their own self decision. That's right. <laughs> right. They, I mean, so and it's, it's, it's tragic because you can, you can, I can help them. <laughs> that's right. Absolutely. Yeah. So those are, those are uh, some, some issues. There are other symptoms. Of course, people can have migraines, uh, increasing mold sensitivity. They'll begin to notice mold more than, than, their, their spouse or other people. Yes, yes, uh, which is obviously a bigger and bigger issue too with all these floods and oh, yeah. weather changes, you know, and humidity, you know. Um, yeah, that to me also is definitely like, you know, it's an alert. And they're telling you, I walk into a moldy building or basement or whatever, and I'm ver my symptoms, my headaches, and all these other things come back that, you know. Right. One of the things that was um, in the... Um, uh, PowerPoint that I had had uh, yeah, was great. Plug, is this idea that increasing mold exposure amplifies Canada symptoms an increase in Canada can amplify mold symptoms. Yeah. So yeah. there can be an interplay between. Yeah, I think I really learned that from your group. Talk, but yeah. I didn't want really to mention that. Yeah. You know, I think I really learned that from your group when I, when I visited Dr. David Morris, you know, awesome. again, over 20 years ago. I mean, the amount of mold allergy that you guys were seeing was really incredible. And again, even in New York back again, 20 years ago, I wasn't appreciating what an issue is. You know, today, again, in my practice, mold allergy and mold toxicity are yeah. things that I'm having to deal with more and more. Um, I want to ask you something too, again, something you mentioned in, again in your article in the textbook, which I do all the time. And again, maybe it's because of our backgrounds in allergy. You know, I, I do the, the candida skin test. Mm -hmm. um, I want to explain how I tell patients, and I, and I want to get your take on this. You know, when I tell patients that I'm going to test them for, you know, because people also, they come in, I want to get tested for candida. Yeah. So uh, I said, okay. I said, unfortunately, there aren't a lot of great tests. I mean, I think the history and the questionnaire from Crook and that other seven question to, are things about whether you've been on antibiotics, corticosteroids, right. birth control. I mean, I think all are super important and obviously probably have the most weight. But people, of course, it's like, you know, the old uh, Missouri thing. I'm from Kansas, you know, whatever. Or she, you know, you got to show me. Or Missouri, was it? You got to, you know, you got to show me. I don't, you know, don't tell me about it. So I'll say, okay, I'm going to do the candida skin test with you. And then I do it on the patients. And this is how I explain it. But then I want to hear your, you know, explanation. So I put the intradermal skin test for candida and I also use trichophyton on the patient. And we wait, you know, about 10 minutes. 
And then I look at the reactivity. And if there's what we call swelling or induration of a certain amount beyond what I put in under the test, you know, we'll consider it a positive. Um, and then I go into my explanation with the patient saying to them, look, I used this test, it was interesting, 40 years ago, <laughs> I'm dating myself now, when I was a resident at, at the hospital in New York City at the height of the AIDS epidemic. This was really before we had very sophisticated T cell Test right. that was really ready available. I mean, you couldn't get it right away. Right. So we would do the skin test on patients that we were concerned that might be immune compromised with HIV. And the way I explained it to my patients, I said, well, so these are the three scenarios. The one scenario, which is the worst one, is that if we do this skin test on you immediately and there's no reaction, okay. Um, and 48 hours later, there's no reaction. That's pretty bad. That's what we call energy, meaning you're having no immune response and we would worry about you might be immune compromised. And that could be an AIDS patient, or a chemotherapy patient. Yeah. The next patient I say is the kind of patient you rarely see in life anymore, the perfect person, quote, so to speak, that you do the skin test, <laughs> there's no immediate reaction, okay? But 48 hours later, they do get a reaction because we all have some candidate in our system. It's called a delayed cell response. <laughs> and the third situation is what a lot of the patients that I'm seeing that I'm essentially confirming candida is that we do the skin test and they have an immediate reaction, almost like I w if I did an allergy skin test, That's right? Like yeah. Right. And then 48 hours later, they're going to react, which I, you know, I tell them to be prepared. And I said, but if they have also a delayed reaction, like where they come in a week later and their arm is still pretty red or swollen, I said this also. And to me a little bit, it, you know, at least it helps guide me until we have more sophisticated tests. So is that something you use? I mean, you know, of course, you know, patients always worry about stool testing, the spit testing for candida. What was your, you know, your guidepost to help if yes. they wanted confirmation? I would say 90% of what you said is exactly what I say to patients. Okay. I say it maybe a little bit differently. Okay. Um, I will have patients who have an immediate reaction to candida, as you mentioned, and no delay and, uh, or slight delay. Uh, and they, they're people who may have urticaria, chronic urticaria, they may have something else. Um, in, in my chapter, I talked about uh, people who have um, chronic urticaria and positive prick testing to Canada responding to Nystatin and mm -hmm. responding to diets. And there's, there's articles in the British Journal of Dermatology on that. But the people that, that have no immediate reaction and an extremely strong delayed reaction are the people in my experience that are most likely to be really sick from Canada. Interesting, okay. And these are people that you'll do the skin test on and they're disappointed. And then the next day, or usually 48 hours later, it begins to swell. Right. Uh, very typically, there will be a, a uh, there can be an ulceration on the skin. Yeah, I've uh, seen that. Mm -hmm. My worst case was one that swelled from the elbow up to the shoulder after the oh, wow. test on the side went to the ER with it. Wow. Um, and uh, when Keith Eaton got interested in this in England, and that's a whole other story. Oh, he wrote a book Keith about Eaton, this, I think, right? Yeah. Yeah, uh, Keith Eaton um, showed in one of his uh, articles a picture of a scar from Canada. Uh, six months after the patient had had a skin test. Wow. So uh, it is an enhanced cellular overimmune reaction, which causes severe inflammation. At that point, I tell patients when they show me that, I say, think about what that's doing in your intestine right now. Yeah, right. That's a great point. Right, because it's so hard to test. Like, you know, again, with the vaginitis, we can do a swab. You know, now, fortunately, we can get DNA of candida albicans or or you know whatever else is going on down there. The tongue, also a little bit more accessible. You can't really get down to the intestinal tract. So yeah. the skin is really essentially giving you the barometer, you know, the same way it does for allergy in a way. Right. You know, other, you know, when people have wheezing, you can't, you're not gonna go down to their lung to test if they're allergic to cats. You do a skin test or a blood test. And, and this is where you always need to distinguish between what is the test measuring? Is it measuring a quantity of yeast, like, a, like is it present or not, and how much. And my experience is with the IgG antibody to candidate, it's more measuring a uh, quantity of yeast uh, or a marker of a significant amount in the past rather than something else. And the value to you, it's measuring, we're, not allowed to get, we're not allowed to get that in New York. It's a very weird thing, you know, but to, I was just out of curiosity, do you find the IgA, IgG test for, or IgE? test for candida in the blood useful to you? Is that 
give any I've done a lot of IgG tests uh, in house, and I find them useful in the sense that almost everyone with Canada related illness does have a high score. But mm. I've seen patients who don't have the reaction and the illness from Canada also have a positive IgG test, uh, almost as a marker that they've they've held it for a while right. and they they have had an exposure to it of significance. And these are people that say. Wow, you know, I took this broad spectrum antibiotic and I got the worst stomach ache afterwards and bloating and gas. Mm -hmm. And my doctor gave me uh, a, a couple diflucan or fluconazole and he gave me some acidophilus and I feel better now. Right. And you, you run a blood test and you say, oh my gosh, your IgG level is 110 or something. And mm -hmm. yeah, it's high. The skin test, what's unique about it is it's measuring the entire immune response, the whole thing from beginning right. to end. And you're, you're introducing Canada into the dermis, you're giving, you're giving an injection of a foreign protein, and you want to see what the immune system does with that. Mm. So I think at this point, the two things I tended to use the most were, as you pointed out, a questionnaire or a good detailed history is number one. And number two would be the skin test. By the way, the saliva test, because I've never done it, you know, with, you know, but people ask me, I guess they must see on the internet. Is there anything to that, you know, as far as you There's know? There's an or... entire cottage industry <laughs> of tests that are out there. Right. None of them, to my experience, have been accepted by right. the medical profession as being valid. Uh, a valid test. Yeah. At least the prick test of Canada is ex mm. accepted. Yes. Uh, your your interpretation of it might mm -hmm. be a little different than someone else's. Right. But it's accepted. So uh, I don't mind people doing the other tests. I've seen thousands of them in my practice. People will mm. come with a thousand of these tests. Really? Say I'm still sick. I've been on yeah. months of antifungal medicine. What's going on here? Mm. Uh, I would add in par parenthetically, this is another reason why it's not accepted. Um, quickly by the medical profession. This is a disease in search of a all powerful, perfectly sensitive and highly specific test. Yeah. And doctors are, are wanting to have a test before they believe in a disease. Yes. So it's yeah, kind it's... Of backwards forwards and yeah it's forwards. right in the meantime people are suffering let's talk let's move on to treatment i think that's so important too and again i've learned from you and your lectures and um but again it's a little bit of an art of medicine as well too um and you i think you've even mentioned too that one of the gold standards for quote diagnosis as you just kind of almost mentioned in a story before is actually the response to treatment Yes. <laughs> you know, see how people do. So I want to ask you about the response to treatment because um, what I've kind of learned a little bit, and I know everybody has a little bit of a different style of things, you know, again, I think just taking, you know, candida vaginitis, which I'm actually going to have a lecture with uh, Dr. Jack Sobel, uh, a, a, a podcast with him next week, because I, I know he's done a lot of work on candida in the vaginal area, but just I remember his article in the New England Journal. Yes, I, I have it here. Ago on yeah. usage and right. Uh, yeah. So it's really, it's really interesting. And, and again, you guys were the forefront of treating the whole, you know, candida hypersensitivity syndrome, which I like to call it. But just out of curiosity too, so when you get a, a, let's say a couple of different scenarios, let's say a woman that comes in with said chronic vaginitis, now she's been to her gynecologist, she's taken maybe one or two diflucan and you know, she got maybe better temporarily, but then she relapses. Nobody ever put her on oral nystatin. How do you treat those patients? I mean, again, a woman for two years, chronic vaginitis, you know, and then you confirm it's cancer, so you get a new swab and do you put them on Diflucan for just two weeks? Do you put them on it for a continual basis for a few months? Do you do the combination with Nystatin? I want to get the Dr. Croker uh, approach. The problem is in Canada. The problem is the vaginal tract is an immunological organ, as oh. you know. Right. And you think of it, I, I try to have a woman think of this exactly the same as the respiratory tract. How is that affected? It's affected by irritants, allergens and infections. And uh, with the vaginal tract, you can have a scenario where, well, uh, and I had this happen and I related it in one of my lectures, uh, a woman eating clementine oranges at Christmas because it's a holiday food. She begins to get itching on day one. There's still oranges left in the refrigerator on day two eats more. Now she's getting a discharge, but it's clear. 
and she's itching. What's been happening here is that she has uh, in the vaginal tract produced some IgE, which is released histamine. And the histamine induces the macrophages to release PGE2, mm -hmm. which in turn yeah. leukin 2 which in turn causes impaired lymphocyte proliferation against Canada. And the third day, she's got a Canada infection. Ah, so the immune system got suppressed, essentially. Correct. The mm -hmm. immune system got suppressed, and she had, had an infection as a result of an... Something an, dietary, right. Right, something dietary. It can happen also, as strange as it sounds, with mold. And I've seen this too, where, where a person will get mold exposure, begin mm. to itch vaginally, get a clear discharge, and get Canada. So you have that. The second. Well, one, wait, wait, before. So, how do you treat, unless you're going to go there, how do you treat a patient like that? So, let's say, okay. because it, it, it won't necessarily recorrect itself, you know, just by stop eating the clementines. That now the process is ongoing now. Right. That person is an allergic individual. Right. So, what I try to do, and, and I know this from studies, is that you can pick up in the vaginal fluid IgE to grass pollen, IgE to spermicides, oh, really? IgE mm -hmm. to walnuts, all sorts of things. I treat that patient the same way as I would if she had respiratory tract mm. problems up here. Mm -hmm. I do my skin testing, find what she is sensitive to, and begin her on immunotherapy. Now, what you'll find in the literature are case reports about resolution of Canada-related illness in these individuals mm -hmm. uh, with immunotherapy. So uh, what you end up doing is just saying different, different organ, but same principle. You've got an immunologically reactive organ with mast cells and mucosa and discharge, and you're going to treat it with, yeah, and using antihistamines is fine. You, you may, in fact, get some results with that, too. Okay, so let's slow down for a second because actually I want to go back to one other point for our, our men listeners because they might have tuned out for a second while we were talking about the vaginal area because one of the most fascinating things to me once I became much more uh, hopefully adept and skilled at treating and diagnosing candida was that uh, the sinuses are another immune organ that are affected and I've had cases where I've prevented fortunately some of these guys especially from going for a second or third sinus surgery when they didn't really benefit from the initial one when I realized that, that it was due to candid inflammation. And the way I, I explain it to the, the guys and to women, you know, sometimes too, when it occurs, I said, you know, it's really fascinating. It takes me back to my histology course in medical school because when they used to put, you know, get ready for exams, they used to like to use um, slide material that was comparable and try to fool you. And one of the ways they, they would put it would be the, the nasal sinus tissue and the vaginal tissue that you had to differentiate because they're both, as you know, squamous cell epithelium. So it just you know makes you realize, and that the microbiome, the the type of you know fungi or yeast that are in the That's sinuses is very similar, story. right? So, yeah. but going back to that though, so before we get to the immunotherapy, which I think is important, I want to hear more of your thoughts about that. What about decreasing the load with antifungals? I mean, as I said, the, the do you don't do you feel that's important to restore the, the microbiome balance? I, I, it's hugely important. Okay. But uh, the, the issue is one where I'm often faced clinically in my practice with people who have done that stuff, but, they, but they're not oh. well because the immunological aberration has... Oh, good point. Okay. But, well, that's so, that's, that they, but both, both of those things are incredibly important. They are. Okay. Because I, I think that it seems to me, let's say in the, in the vaginitis cases, which I'm going to go more into with Dr. Sobel, it seems like the gynecologists are stopping way short of what's really needed. Um, you know, and what I found to be a great friend in treating Candida, which I, again, I learned from you guys and from the work of Dr. Crook and, and Ann Bork was being on Nystatin longer while you're doing the immunotherapy. Cause as you know, too, immunotherapy takes time to work. Oh, I, yeah. We have to always explain to the patients. It's like weightlifting. You get to start with your two pound weights and you go to your four pound weights. So, and people are impatient. They want, you know, results yesterday. <laughs> so, well, you know, uh, there's a um, gynecologist I've worked with who's a professor of medicine, a professor of OBGYN at the University of Iowa. Mm. And she called me one day and said, I'm seeing your patients uh, in follow-up and their yeast infections have gone. Mm. Can I work with you? Mm. And I said, great. So I had this relationship with this individual for about 10 years and she would send me patients who had seasonal vaginitis. She had one woman who really? had spring, mm would get yeast vaginitis every spring like clockwork. Um, 
she sent that individual. Um, I had one woman that you'll be fascinated by who came in to see me and she goes, I, I, there's something with this Canada thing. And I said, what happened? And she goes, I had a yeast infection. My doctor gave me one fluconazole pill. My vaginitis went away, but my sinuses opened up for the first time in years. Then they shut again by the third day. Right. So she goes, I don't understand it. I hear you're into Canada issues, but uh, I was totally flummoxed by that. Mm -hmm. I didn't expect the sinuses to do anything. Right. What's going on? They're always pleasantly surprised. Yeah. So explain to the listeners, and, and again, I, I probably can learn from this as well too, but you know, I also, I've been doing subliminal neurotherapy since I trained with you guys 20 years ago. Um, and for the environmental allergies, I just started doing for the foods, which is really exciting. I know you guys really led the way on that too, like with peanut and other dangerous foods, which is super exciting. Gary has done a lot of excellent work in that. Yeah. yeah. But tell me about the candida, you know, because sometimes patients ask me now, because I understand like, you know, when we, we treat someone for an environmental allergy, whether it's grass, trees, ragweed, it's an external thing. We're giving them very low doses in the beginning, building up to higher doses, and they're building up what we believe is blocking antibodies, et cetera. How does the, the candida, we believe, sublingual treatment work? Again, the same concept, you're building up some blocking candida antibodies. I mean, how, how do you see? It, it probably works with a type four immune mechanism. Uh, and immune, sublingual immunotherapy works via different mechanisms via the dose you give and the frequency you give. Okay. Now, I, I tell patients, if I'm using doxycycline, I might use one dose if you have acne. And if you have mycoplasma, I might use another dose. Okay. It's a different illness that, that and you, you customize the dose. Okay. So I found early with Dave that if I had a patient who had a strong delayed reaction on their arm to dilution number three, and I treated them with three, they would be one sick puppy. They mm, would it's too, so too intense for them, right. Mm -hmm. So you have to back off on your dose and treat mm -hmm. the first negative wheel in a sense that, mm -hmm. that doesn't give you a strong delayed reaction. Okay. And this individual has a type four reaction. Dave pioneered the work with nickel allergy. Yes, that's right. That's why that's why I found out about him. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, it can be used for a, a cellular type response, and it works very well for that. Mm -hmm. uh, now, again, if you have somebody who has uh, an IgE mediated type one exclusive reaction, and their skin test does not show a strong delay, a little delay, that's normal, mm -hmm. and then a strong positive, you, you do your standard. Uh, dose. Those and things. The first dose, yeah. Give you a seven yeah. millimeter wheel, you treat. And you think that over several months, they're building up some type of protective immunity so that, because I'm going to get to my next question, you know, because the biggest question a lot of patients ask, and I, I understand this, they'll say, how long do I have to be on this candidate? Be like, this is tough. You know, I mean, not only are you avoiding, you know, uh, gluten products, which, you know, uh, you know, because that's the wheat is one of the triggers and sugar. Um, but, you know, there's certain things, too, that also elevate the blood sugar, like rice. So I was just curious how, you know, like based on Crook's work and, and other people about the diet, because it seems like the candida diet hasn't changed in decades. You know, do you let people have more leeway? They've been on the treatment for a while. Because I know like Marjorie Crandall, and I know she knows you, but I, you know, she, uh, was, she's a PhD researcher. And she feels that the candida diet is a little bit uh, over the top after a while and you know which is nice for some patients because they again they just feel so restricted so i was just curious your approach how do you um how do you counsel the patients about the yeah. diet um this gets into unfortunately or fortunately it gets into the art of medicine your own okay. experience the person you're dealing with okay um i think that um what you're what we're trying to do and i explain this to the patient is that strong reaction you had on your skin to Canada indicates that you're having a lot of inflammation from the yeast organism, a mm. tremendous amount. You're overreacting and you want to, your immune system is like the TSA. They should sort people and <laughs> attack the bad people and let the safe ones go through. Right. <laughs> so you should normally have some Canada in your system. You know you do. Your sister or brother do too. Right. You should have no reaction like this. Right. When we take this reaction down, we should see it here on the skin become a little better. And 
uh, if we see that you're feeling better, the next step would probably be on special occasions to have a little something that right. you would enjoy with your family. Okay. Not daily. I right. don't think I, I advise that. Okay. Now, where the art of this comes in is let's take two different people. And the first person is compliant and doing everything right. The second person is living in a moldy house, mm. uh, has an abusive husband or an abusive spouse, uh, is highly stressed, working too hard. Um, how are they going to do with a little leeway on their diet? Um, good it, point. It's a real... Really important point. You know, one of the things I just want to make the listeners to know also too, because I, I share this with patients that gets them to smile a little bit too. And I tell them, unfortunately, stress is like eating 10 cookies. You know, your core, your body doesn't know the difference. The cortisol shoots up. I mean, I don't know exactly that's true, but, but essentially, you know, we know that stress elevates your cortisol, which again, elevates your blood sugar and, you know, that whole cascade. So I, I think you're bringing out such an important point, you know, because again, too, a lot of times it seems it's always the perfect storm. It's like, a patient may have been on antibiotics earlier in their life, and now why five, seven years later, they weren't on antibiotics that much, but obviously their microbiome changed, but now they're going through a divorce or there was a death in the family and or they lost their job. And I think the stress, whatever, has changed their microbiome even more. And now now the, now the candidate is coming out in, in various ways. See, if I, if I had this whole, this whole video Zoom, couple down i would just take your comments if that's all we could show for five minutes that's going to be our uh, that's going to be our, our clip that's, that's the, <laughs> you know to get um, you know what it is people need cover they need to realize they're not crazy I, as i said you know going back to what we talked about earlier i think the heartbreak that i see in my practice and i'm sure you've seen year after year is patients in tears and also a little bit of pressure on me when they're like you're my last hope Yes. You know, and I did a video called the 10th doctor because literally I was in a lot of these cases, the 10th doctor to, you know, to see them. They've saw the rheumatologist, ENT, pulmonologist, yeah. gynecologist, yeah. dermatologist. I could go on and, you know, uh, and it's so rewarding when you can help them. I mean, that's, that's to me yeah. is what makes this, you know, so, you know, pleasurable to practice medicine in these difficult times. I remember I remember sitting down with Billy Crook on an airplane flight and we had left an allergy meeting and we were sitting down discussing things and he talked about the fact that Canada patients are are so uh, challenging patients but they're also so rewarding as patients mm. but they are draining to the healthcare provider too. Because if they, well if said, they, right but they're they're also the draining well I should say draining but they're they're um overwhelming if someone has five or 10 minutes to spend with the patient. That's right. You and I, when we were fortunate in our like private practices to be able to spend extended time with patients, that's a whole different ball game. You're going to, people are going to open up, you're going to hear things and then that's going to guide you. And I think, and, uh, yeah, you know, that that's absolutely true. And I have another lecture on sublingual immunotherapy that I've given and it has the quotation of an article and the article divided two groups of allergy patients into high stress and low stress. Mm. And then it gave patients slit in the high stress groups and slit in the low stress groups for dust mite. Mm. And then after, and I can't remember whether it was a year or two, but after the two year period, I believe, they reassessed the patients and they assessed the high stress group and the low stress group on how they did to slit. It's the only study I'm aware of that's done that. Wow. And it's exactly what you said earlier, in a sense. And that is the high stress group didn't do nearly as well mm -hmm. as the stress group. So coming full circle to your question, I always take a quick inventory on the stress issues when I'm talking about the diet. The sure. diet. Yeah. But in general, yes, the diet is to some extent, I tell patients the issue isn't trying to control Canada completely. The issue is to try to control Canada reasonably and to get the immune system as well functioning as we can so that what little Canada but necessary Canada you have, it's not, it's not going to affect you. That, that's a great point. You know what I like to tell patients too, because you know, again, you, you, you tell so many stories that you get involved with the patients because a lot of times patients will come and say to me, I want my Canada wiped out. Yeah. And I yeah. say to that, and I say to them, look, 
we made a mistake. You know, I want to give I want to give them an analogy. I said, you know, the United States made a mistake when they went into Iraq. They said, you know, we got to wipe out Saddam Hussein. They should have just weakened him like they did the first time. I said, because once you wipe him out, other bad things come in its place. So that's my political thing. But so no, we, no. we want to get it back in balance. That's what I try to tell the patients because we're supposed to have some candida yeast and other bacteria and viruses and whatever, you know, fungi in our system, but it's got to be in balance. And so it's not a question of like, we're going to wipe this thing out. It's going to be a question of we're going to get you back. That's back right. we're on the same page entirely. You know? And the patient who takes more and more antifungals and gets worse and worse with right. the bowel, has yeah. SIBO until proven otherwise. And mm, uh, you see a lot of, I, I have seen a lot of patients who have, have seen other people, and I've done it too, I'm sure, at different times, and we've overtreated and we've mm. given so many. It's tricky, yeah. Events, yeah. And uh, they've, they've used so much probiotic, they now get sick on taking probiotics. That really? Wow. I, I meant to ask you about that. So probiotics, what does that fit in? Do you feel a lot of the patients on Canada? You know, it's funny. I was just talking, I saw a lecture by Dr. Fasano, who I spoke to before. You know, it's, I, I feel in probiotics are in their infancy. I mean, it's really hard to advise patients whether they should take it, they shouldn't, whether it does anything. Again, it's so individual. Was that something that you still felt was pretty important or, because, you know, one of the things, oh, one sorry, the thing too, Dr. Kroger, you know, one of the things that people really confuse, and it's almost the hallmark of Canada, is, you know, people have heard so much about how fermented foods are good for you, right? The sauerkraut, is that too? Well, I'm sure you've seen this. I've seen this multiple times where a patient is, I'm doing the program with them and also they come back and go, I'm doing terrible. And I'm like, and I'm confused for a second. What did, what did we do wrong here? And they're like, well, I'm eating all these fermented foods. I heard they're good for you. I said, you just did a, a candida challenge. <laughs> so, right. Do you, do you see that? <laughs> um, so yeah, where's probiotics? In this? We're, we're in our infancy with probiotics. Obviously yeah. it's something we're in entire agreement with. And yeah. uh, I could probably stop there. However, the use of probiotics uh, for me is motivated primarily the driving force is looking at how much stress their intestines have. Mm -hmm. In other words, if I'm dealing with a, a young college student who is now out of school because she's so tired and she has had uh, four years of broad spectrum tetracycline usage or doxycycline usage for acne, right. I'm going to give a probiotic and I'm, you know, and again, different ones for different people, but I would certainly think somebody like that deserves a broad spectrum probiotic. Wait, what is one of your favorites, if I can pin you down? Do you like VSL number three or any, is there a certain one that you liked? I'm just, uh... VSL number three I've used and I've liked that. Uh, I've also used uh, Claire Labs probiotics. Yes, I heard that's I've good used, too. Yeah, and, yeah. and again, uh, I, it's a very challenging thing, I think for the practitioner like you or me to say, this one is, is going to work. The one. Yeah. It, it's the one. Yeah. Um, I think VSL number three has got some good studies for closed loop syndrome or for um, uh, overgrowth uh, issues. It, it, you know, there's some, there's some studies in different ones, but there's no general agreement. Yes. Yeah. It is. It's frustrating, but uh, I, I think on the horizon, that's going to be. I think uh, the take home for me is that as a practitioner, I always use them when I'm faced with somebody who is antibiotic predominant. If the person wasn't on much antibiotics, but we're eating a lot of sugar, I might cut out the sugar. I might give them a small amount of it, a probiotic for a while, but not a whole bunch. Interesting. Okay. Well, we have discussed so many things. I'm going to just summarize for the listeners uh, some of the key points that candida hypersensitivity is a real condition that is frequently overlooked by conventional physicians, including gynecologists, gastroenterologists, dermatologists, even allergists. Um, rebalancing your system, your microbiome with a yeast-free diet, low in sugar, uh, the, the proper usage of antifungal medications can be very important. And as Dr. Croker mentioned, you know, some of the things that some specialists use, sublingual uh, immunotherapy also could probably be very helpful to these chronic difficult cases. Uh, Dr. George Croker, I want to thank you so much for your contribution today on this misunderstood condition and all the work you've done. I, I hope maybe also the listeners will be on the lookout because when I just found out from Dr. Croker, he's working on some of his writing pieces. I used to enjoy a lot his Renaissance Allergist blog. I think that's, you know, he had some really, um, some really in interesting insights. Uh, so thanks again for taking the time uh, for being on. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Questions? Okay. 
were the questions I've had over the years. So I'm glad I had a chance to discuss them with somebody with a lot of experience too. Thank you. Thank you.